God therefore creates a second party. Man. Hebrews 2 6, on which the manifest is attribute. If the man does not have free will and choice, then he cannot return love. An ornament cannot love. The man must have a choice. Joshua 24 15. And to have a choice, there must be a third party. The third party is a cherub who became a serpent. You can choose him. Second Corinthians 4 4 or God. 1 Kings 18.21 God allows this being to appear to tempt mankind so that man can freely choose God as an object of love. Adam chooses his wife as an object while she chooses knowledge as all good intellectuals. And the man falls and God redeems the man, Romans 5, 6 to 10, by bearing the entire blame for the man and the cherub himself as a man. Isaiah 53, Romans 10, 2 Corinthians 3. Having involved himself of all guilt, it is now possible for the man to be confirmed sinless forever by receiving a sinless Savior as his own. John 1, 10 to 12, your move. I said it's your move. Why do you sit there glassy-eyed preparing to run for something you read to prove that Christ was a rascal like Khalil Gibran, Omar Khayyam, Zarathustra, Buddha, Confucius, Zoroastra, Leo Samahatma Gandhi, or St. George, or like yourself? It's your move. God has already done all that is possible, all that could be asked, more than is required, and he has done it through love for you, you sorry old Christ-rejecting, Bible-denying Pharisee. John 3.16 God has absolved himself from all guilt, proving that he is absolutely perfect and sinless. Now, how about you? How about your moral condition? Go oh, on, move. Don't sit there all day. The next move is checkmate no matter which way you move. Why do you sit there looking at the pieces like you thought Darwin would give you an extra queen in a few minutes? The battlefields of this war are strewn and littered with men who refuse this line of biblical reasoning and more are on the way. God is innocent. You are guilty. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. What are you going to do? Go on, move. Or just jump over the whole chessboard and stomp your little feet out of the door and go home pouting about, I just don't believe in the virgin birth. It's not scientific. Or he's trying to give me a guilt complex. <laughs> you, you, you're not very scientific yourself. As a matter of fact, you need a scientific, reasonable, logical honor. Or in view of your refusal to accept God's invitation to salvation, if I may say so, not even decent. Now go back to Socrates. Aristotle, Plato, Huxley, De Maupassant, Shelley, Carlisle, Dickens, Tennyson, Thackeray, Einstein, Jarman, Gray, Kelly, Wells, Spengler, Joyce, Jung, Pavlov, Nietzsche, and Hegel, and see if they have an answer to the origin of sin better than the one I just gave you, and if they have a better solution. And listen, if they do, apply it immediately, because as sure as you live and breathe, the hospital beds and the graves are waiting for you. They embrace the thinkers and the poets and the artists and the scholars and the popes and the psychiatrists and the physicians. And, buddy, they're going to get you, too. Hebrews 9, 27. You haven't moved yet. God has already moved in history to restore his original creation. He has plans. And these plans are going to go through on a schedule no matter what your church teaches or no matter what your professors may have told you. The first part of the plan is to populate the heaven and the earth with a sinless race of people like God himself. How do you know this is right? Because at this minute that you are reading this treatise or hearing it, men are expending dollars by the billion to get up and populate it with a bunch of Christ-rejecting, Bible-denying, sacramental Darwinian apes. You see the two ways to do it. God's way and your way. Isaiah 55, 8. Your way is Lucifer's original plan, outlined carefully in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. Hello, Darwin, fancy meeting you here. And with the rocket scientists and astronauts sitting on your right hand, your left. I have some vague recollection that this, <coughs> you will be like God, that occurred in some other place in the Bible. If my memory does not fail me completely, 
I believe it is in Genesis 3 where the serpent puts in his earthly appearance. <clears throat> you know, your way is easy. Of course, it will take two or three more wars, you know, and a few million more amputated arms and legs, deathbeds, mass graves, concentration camps, gauze rolls, iodine, sulfur tablets, morphine, mattress covers, dog tags, broken hearts, broken homes. But after all, man is evolving. I mean, your way is easy. You simply exert your depraved mind and faculties to the utmost and find a way to get up off the earth and populate Jupiter, Venus, and the moon and then me immediately claim it for your country so you can bomb, strap, sabotage, shoot, burn up, demolish, and wreck an enemy country. <clears throat> Instead of intercontinental war, Darwin's educated asses will have interplanetary war and they will begin to write history books on how the great sacrifice preserved freedom on planet X and was a lesson to all free planets everywhere. But the dead will be just as dead and just as dead in sins. John 9, 24. Your way is easy. It is the way that man has trodden since Cain murdered his brother. Just use your brains, avoid the Bible, invent ways to get up, reject the Lord Savior, kill the enemy before he gets you, sidestep Calvary, join a church, get baptized, Ignore Genesis 1, 3, take the sacraments, get in your rocket, and go till you die, and they bury you. Your way is easy. Fools like you have been going to hell on that route for 5,000 years. It is a broad way and the gates wide, Matthew 7, 13, and you still haven't moved. Are you going to move? I mean, after all, it is so easy on you, yourself, because no matter how long it takes mankind to make it to the planets, you will have been dead for a good while. You and Darwin both believe that when you're dead, that's the end of you. Isn't that right? Or has someone in a pulpit misrepresented your position? Or, or you wanted to go to heaven? <laughs> Sorry, you are on the wrong way. John 14, 6. Uh, the trouble is that man has it all figured out. But this figuring is based on the kingdom ideas of chapter 1. These ideas have all proven to be false for the passage of time. And it is absolutely certain that whether he makes the moon or not, he might. His kingdom will be nothing but a madhouse of wars, rumors of wars, political intrigue, religious corruption, disease and poverty, dying and death, business swindles, dope addiction, juvenile delinquency. That old phantom human nature will not leave the house. Human from humus, decayed vegetation. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 64. Verse 6. <laughs> All of man's theories in the kingdom failed to reckon with this phantom of human nature, this invisible wreck of the Hesperus. The Bible never fails to recognize his presence, Romans 6 and 7, never fails to predict his end, Romans 6, 23, Psalm 9, 17, and never fails to present the only remedy for him, Galatians 2, 20, Colossians 3, 1 to 14. Will you move and take it? The easy way is the wrong way. God's way is the only way that will work and work right, and God's principles are contrary to man's. Thus, everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The way up to heaven, my friend, is down on your knees. John 1, 10 to 13. The way to get shot down out of the stratosphere is to go up and populate it. How true is that notation made by C.I. Schofield? Quote, the world system is imposing and powerful with armies and fleets, is often outwardly religious, scientific, cultured, and elegant, but seething with national and commercial rivalries and ambitions, is upheld in any real crisis only by armed force. God's original plan contains none of these elements, like pure virgin wool or Damascus steel. The quality and merit of this divine plan stands out as against crocus sack compared with tin cans. That is, in comparison with a crocus sack, God's plan is pure virgin wool. And alongside the tin can plan of Darwin, God's plan is Damascus steel. God's plan was and is to populate the entire universe for the race of sinless people made like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This plan is flawless without a crook in it, and subsequent failures are due entirely to man's willful and stubborn determination to take credit for his own creation and give himself the glory for coming to his present state after four million years of fighting planaria, paramecium, hydras, jellyfish, polywogs, 
alligators, possums, apes, and weasels, where a man moves in response to his obligation to God, that is, where he moves by faith in accepting God's Savior as his own, John 1, 10 to 13, light breaks immediately. And although all the answers are not found in all the Bible verses, the light is found that illuminates the hopeless struggle through the ages to that golden age. It also brings assurance of a heavenly home and a glorious eternity with God. 1 John 5, 13, 1 Peter 1, 4, John 14, 1 to 4. God has moved, and it is your move. And until you move, you have no place in the kingdom, Matthew 8, 11, no part in the kingdom, Matthew 25, 31, nor can you even see it, John 3, 3 to 6. This is Don Nesbitt, YouTube. The answers are available. The plan is presented in the Word of God. In the following chapters, you will see the mighty arm of the Creator of the galaxies and constellations bare to the sight of all, on the counter of the dime store, one dollar a copy, and this plan centers around the kingdom. <clears throat> it is the main subject of the Word of God. The conception, development, disintegration, revival, postponement, counterfeit, and fulfillment of this kingdom is the theme of the Holy Book. It runs contrary to the post-millennial position. It runs contrary to the post-millennial liberal, the amillennial Catholic, the Darwinian intellectual, the idealistic philosopher, and the communist atheist. As most Bible concepts, it is proven to be a direct revelation from the superhuman sources by virtue of the fact that it is totally unlike anything any history or historian can produce. God has plans for mankind and for the universe that no pope, no church council, no league, alliance, mandate, pact, Charter, decree, or court decision can alter or forestall. Once this plan is grasped, all the pieces of the puzzle fall into the proper compartment, and even the men opposed to the plan, and the men who don't believe in it, find their proper places in respect to it. Luke 17, 1, Proverbs 16, 4. As a famous retired Methodist preacher once said, maybe we are, are all through, maybe we are completely washed up, but our God is not. No, he is not. Isaiah 9, 6-7. A little girl went to bed one night after sitting in the living room and hearing the conversation of the adults for about two hours. They were Bible-believing people, and they talked at length about the tribulation, the Antichrist, the rise of Rome, the threat of communism, the moral degeneracy in America, and the excessive governmental controls. When the little girl knelt by her bed to pray, she said earnestly, Dear God, please take good care of Mom and Daddy and brother and sis. And, Lord, please take good care of me and my dolly. And, dear Lord, please, please take good care of yourself, because if anything happens to you, we're sunk. Let the heathen rage. Let Darwin and Huxley thumb the nose at God Almighty. Let the Pope guzzle wine while the papist kiss his feet. Let the scholars stamp on the word of God and try to exterminate it. Our God is a great God, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? Daniel 4.35 It's your move. And no matter where you move, it's checkmate. God has done his part. Your part is to accept what he has done, Romans 10, 9 to 10, or else concede the game, or else re-enlist and get ready for the next war, brother, because it's coming. Man thinks he is through with war, but our God has not yet begun to fight. Chapter 4, Conception and Development In Matthew 3, 2, we find the bronze prophet in the leather girdle and a camel's hair coat proclaiming, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But when the man heralded by this message shows up, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye. Mark 1.15 To further confuse matters, in Matthew 4.17, this one that John heralded says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now in these opening verses in the gospel accounts can be found the duality of all the confusion that follows in the private interpretations of the kingdom. It appears on the surface that they are identical. This teaching is so firmly entrenched in the minds of Protestants who have believed the private interpretations of Rome that it is almost impossible to dislodge it. Common sense would tell any man that the word heaven is not the same word as the word God. But when the two kingdoms, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, are both said to be at hand, 
The expositors, commentators, preachers, and teachers follow Rome suit and miss the trick. It might be well to review a basic rule of intelligence. It is this. Things different are not equal. This rule is deserved in every place on earth except in matters of integration, church councils, church doctrine, communist conspiracies, church interpretations, and Bible expositions. Things different are not equal. To return for a moment to the battlefield of Gettysburg, where 25,000 Southerners and 23,000 Northerners died to prove something, we find a tall, egotistical deist who never professed anything more than James 2.19, standing and reciting as follows, quote, Government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, unquote. Notice how strangely incongruous this statement is alongside of repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Something is out of place somewhere. And there's no use to alibi and say one is spiritual and the other is political, for God who is not interested in political kingdoms as well as spiritual is not much of a God. John speaks of a kingdom which God will rule. Lincoln speaks of a government which people will run. There is a slight disparity in the two messages. Someone has died rightly or wrongly, it is hard to say which. But 48,000 dead Carolinians, Alabamians, Buckeyes, Vermonters, Mississippians, Virginians, Pennsylvanians, and New Yorkers surely must have known what they were doing. Or did they? The patriotism and heroic deeds performed at Gettysburg become cloudier by the minute when we read, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. Now, one of the truths, then, for which Americans die on the battlefield is this, quote, All men are created equal. That is, men are murdered to prove that that is correct. Now, if this is so, not a death in World War I, two, or three is in vain. If it is not so, then someone has badly deceived someone and all of them ought to get the brains blown out for an ideal that is no more right than addiction to heroin. When we compare American ideals with Bible truth, we find a tragic breach. It is nearly as wide as comparison of German ideals, Russian ideals, Italian ideals, and British ideals. One cannot study the ideals for which men die, trying to bring in a new order or a golden age, without being struck by the fact that they are all in opposition to the Word of God. This kingdom business is the first thing that comes to the reader's attention. Lincoln is speaking of a government of, by, and for men, with all men the same. The same doctrine is taught by Karl Marx and carried out in the French Revolution. The Bible is speaking of a kingdom of, by, and for God, with men divided into sheep and goats, Matthew 25, 31 to 40. The further comparisons only emphasize and enlarge the gap between the two concepts. In the Bible, men are not equal in any way, shape, or form other than their moral obligation and moral opportunity in relation to their Creator. Acts 10.34, Romans 2.6, Luke 13.1. God discriminates against individuals before birth, Romans 9.13, after birth, Genesis 17.17, 17, Physically, John 9, 1 to 5. Spiritually, 2 Peter 2, 12. Individually, Job 1 to 6. Racially, Jeremiah 30, 11. And mentally, Proverbs 6, 16 to 18. In the Bible, men are only equal in that they are born dead in trespass and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 to 4, and must be born again regardless of religious attainment or station in life, John 3, 1 to 8. In the Bible, all the popular elections are wrong, and only where the Word of God is prayerfully honored as the final authority is a right decision made. I'm not talking about a religious authority with black and white smoke set up a smokestack by a bunch of black robed veiled priests who think that tradition is equal to the Bible. I have said where the Bible is the final authority. Notice Saul's popular election and Barabbas' popular majority in 1 Samuel 8:11, Matthew 27, John 19, and compare this with a scriptural vote in Acts 6 and Acts uh, 15, Acts 6 and Acts 15. The Bible, then, stands as an anti-popular and anti-social book. It stands for everything that men resent and against everything they are for, Luke 16, 15. In short, the Bible is the greatest hate literature on the market if a man is a Darwinian anarchist. This brings us to the crux of the matter. 
what mankind resents in the Bible is the absolute moral authority by which it speaks contrary to his human nature. <clears throat> the whole thing is enmeshed and entwined with Darwin versus Genesis 1 to 3. In the United States, the equal opportunity is supposed to be brought about by force if necessary. See Meredith, General Motors, Union, and so forth and so on. Nothing is left to God or the Bible, for it is assumed that God has left Darwin and Mother Nature to kind of work it out. The inequalities, then, are never regarded as God-given, God-sustained, or God-honored. Inequalities are looked upon as failures of someone to tolerate or educate somebody or give them social privileges. In plainer words, the unregenerate educated man in America hopes eternally that since he has worked his way up from an ape without God's help, he doesn't need God's book interfering in his future progress. He will work it out himself by brute force if necessary. He will nullify the Bible by putting it in a pigeonhole called religion or Judaistic Christian tradition, and there it cannot interfere with government. If the Bible makes it plain that all men are not created equal, then men will jolly well kill 50,000 to 90,000 men per war to prove that they are. If the Bible favors the Jewish race above the others, then he will jolly well take the old Jewish Bible, every writer in it is a Jew, and revise it till it is an Italian Catholic Bible. If the Word of God insists that God is sovereign and demands the right and power to rule over individuals, as well as nations, man will just kick God off his throne and prove that he himself is capable of running himself. If the Bible presents a king who is king over the kingdom of God, who enters history telling men to repent, then, bless your soul, this little educated American will just get on his hind legs and say, Government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Oh, you know, no repenting, no Bible believing, no new birth. Just keep on trying to run it your way. Hurrah, hurrah for the red, white, and but let's get a hold of ourselves. This way leads nowhere but to another war. That isn't all. By the time you have finished studying the kingdom, you will find that it leads to something worse than war. It will lead to slavery and a government of Rome, by Rome, for Rome, that will perish from this earth. With this orientation, let us get all side issues out of our minds. The Bible presents a kingdom of God and a kingdom of heaven. It does not present a Roman Catholic Church, a socialistic republic, a democratic United States, a fascist Germany, a red China, or a communist Cuba. It presents the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And these two are not the same. Things different are not equal. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is not Bible truth. Neither is the Constitution. Neither is Marx's Manifesto. Neither is Mein Kampf. Neither is a Catholic Catechism. And neither is the Bill of Rights. For God has no rights. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven deal with Bible truth given by the author of all infallible doctrine concerning man and history. The entrance of thy words giveth light. No matter what a man may think a word says, in view of the fact that he is donned glasses colored by his church, it still says what it says, not what he thinks it says. The word God, for example, is God, not heaven. It is true that Rome has set an example for the world to follow in matters of private interpretation, but this is not all of the facts. No matter how many priests, bishops, and popes think that the word rock in Matthew 16, 18 is Peter, the fact remains that the word is not Peter, it is rock. Since Peter is Petrus, and rock is Petra, and Peter is Petrus, and rock is Petram, and Peter is Peter, and rock is rock, that it is not in the least possible that Peter is the rock or that the rock is Peter. Whatever excursions may be taken by expositors in an effort to properly exegete the passage, one salient fact forever remains, things that are different are not equal. Amos 3, verse 3. Unless there is a deliberate definition given equating two things to be identical, they are not identical. The only place in the Word of God, or anywhere else for that matter, where different things are equal is where they are defined as equal by the verb this is, it is, that is, those are, he is, she is, etc. Friend, if it is not, then it is not, it is, is. A colored man asked his wayward son if he had already married. He replied grumpily, I ain't said I is. I didn't ask you, is you ain't, the father shouted. I asked you, ain't you is. 
accused body, which is the church, is a definition, which can be taken literally in view of comparative passages, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. This defines the take, eat, this is my body of Matthew 26. For the body seated is a physical body holding the bread, and the body eaten is a spiritual body, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. Things different are not equal. So instead of following Rome into a smog of private interpretation, let the reader follow the Holy Spirit as he guides into all truth, John 16, 13, and reveals the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Having straightened out whatever inconsistencies may have prevailed in our thinking in regard to things being the same, let us examine these two words which certainly are not the same. One, God, G-O-D. Two, Heaven, H-E-A-V-E-N. No matter how deceptively the minds of men may operate as they read the passages in Mark 1.15, Matthew 3.2, and Matthew 4.17, they must be brought to realize a fundamental truth. God is not heaven, and heaven is not God. The Schofield note tries to retain the distinction between the kingdoms, but unfortunately Schofield, as Peters and McLean, failed to grasp the original plan and make connections coming through Adam to Christ. McLean and Peter's works are both concisive, profound, fundamental, and faithful to the essentials of Scripture, but neither grasp the greatness of the kingdom, as both these men end the kingdom at Revelation 22. In Revelation 22, it is just the real beginning. There are 12 reasons why a person can know that God is not heaven and heaven is not God. One, birds fly in the heaven, they do not fly in God. Two, there are clouds in the heaven, there are no clouds in God. Three, God created the heavens, so they are an object, not a part of it. Four, God was in the beginning, the heavens were not. Five, the heavens are material, you can see them. Six, God is a spirit, no man has seen at any time, John 1, 18. Seven, God has a moral nature, the heavens as nature itself is amoral. Eight, God controls the heavens, they do not control him. Nine, the heavens declare the glory of God, not themselves. Ten, the heavens contain much darkness, and in God there is no darkness. Eleven, the heavens can be populated, but God cannot be populated. Twelve, the words God and heaven are spelled different. Thus, any man can safely conclude that whatever the kingdom of God is, and whatever the kingdom of heaven is, they are not the same. This distinction must be made in the beginning. We dare not confuse the two.